Welcome to Lunchtime with the Masters, brought to you by PICA. I'm Brett Robotsky, and we are fortunate today to have Dr. Patrick Dehir. Patrick is a board of trustee member of the American Podiatric Medical Association. He's chairing the legislative committee currently. He's been a past president of the Indiana Podiatry Association. He is the team doctor to the Indiana Pacers. And he's also been running a mission for diabetic feet in Haiti. So this guy knows all, you know, he's got this whole thing figured out. So, Pat, welcome to Meet the Masters. Thanks for having me. Equinus is one of those passions. I see you lecturing around the country, even internationally, on it. Why does Equinus develop? Why? What's the prevalence? You know, it's, it's very prevalent. It affects most of the things we do. I, I put together a list of associated pathologies, and it's in the literature been associated with over 30 different pathologies to lower extremity and foot. Um, Jim Amos is a foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon from Cincinnati, and he's come out with some theories on why equinus develops. We see it so much more prevalent in older adults and, and as people get older as opposed to children, and he has like five reasons. Why does it progress? Well, one is... When we, as we get older, we become more sedentary. We're not stretching that muscle tendon unit like we were when we were kids. We're not running and jumping. And because of the law of Davis, muscle tendon units will contract to their maximal stretch point because we're not really stretching it like we were when we were kids. So that's one thing. Two is, as we get older, we just become less, less flexible. And three is genetics. And really, the fourth part is very interesting. He calls it reverse evolution. When we went from walking on for, as quadrupeds to bipeds, certain muscles had to lengthen and certain muscles had to shorten to rotate our foot 70 degrees to get it down flat on the ground. Okay. So the things that had to lengthen were the gastroc and the hamstrings and the hip flexors. So as we get older, because that occurred later in the evolutionary process, they're the first muscles to tighten up. And I think that's just a fascinating concept. It's an interesting concept. way of looking at it. Yeah. When people have equinus, is it both legs equivalent? Is one leg more than the other? It's interesting. I just completed a study of 250 patients. We're getting ready to, to write it up. And um, there have been a couple studies that looked at equinus and stretching, but they never really talked on bilaterality of equinus. But in both those studies, they both started with the same number at the same starting point, both the right side and the left side. In the study I just completed of over about 250 patients, there was no statistical difference between right and left. Okay, so we're, we're who we are. Right. And all that stuff. When equinus is affecting the foot, what's the first joint that compensates? It's the navicular cuneiform joint. The navicular Je cuneiform yeah. joint. Jeff Christensen uh, did a great series of articles uh, on the first ray. And one of the things they looked at in uh, number five of that series was, as you load the Achilles tendon, what happens to each of the bones on the first ray? So they put sensors on these and loaded the Achilles tendon. And what he showed was the first metatarsal and the first cuneiform elevated the navicular and talus plantar flex. So that downward force was going through the navicular cuneiform joint. Um, and that's really where all but the Jeff did that on a jig, you know, right. in an Ingstrom right. machine, right. a jig. As that happens in real life, it tends to medialize. You know, the weight shifts out of the way when it starts to happen. Well, and, but, and Jim Amos just came out with an article. I, it's just in press actually right now, and he calls it the split second effect. And it happens um, after the heel rocker, once you hit the ankle rocker in late mid stance, there is a downward force through the mid tarsal joints, the navicular cuneiform joint, um, which he calls the fourth rocker. So instead of getting to the forefoot or the third rocker, it adds an extra rocker to the foot, which uh, he used uh, photography and motion analysis and then slowing down that and looking at the changes of the foot. And it actually only took place over about a tenth of a second where that pathological force occurs. But you have to think about that, how many steps a person takes a day over a period of oh, time. Sure. It's a cumulative destructive effect. So it seems that equinus is the root of all evils. I remember somebody gave a lecture a long time <laughs> about that. Right. But it seems to be responsible for almost all the pathology that we tend to treat. Right. We're under-treating it, aren't we? We are. In, in fact, in that same article, he said, he goes, equinus is not part of the equation when it comes to foot and ankle problems. He goes, equinus is the equation. And I couldn't agree more with it. It is everything else that develops is subsequent to that deforming force of the Achilles tendon on the foot. I had a doctor, I meet the masters a couple, almost a year ago from Louisiana, an orthopedic surgeon who said that that equinus needs to be dealt with. Uh, mm -hmm. He called it tent muscle tendon balancing. He right. just did a resection. But that just seems to be the answer. Is it surgical, or are there other treatments out there today? Well, you can, you can certainly treat it conservatively. Um, bracing versus patients stretching themselves is an interesting discussion. 
Um, just from a compliance standpoint, I, most of the literature says it takes at least six weeks to get a ga the gastroxyloidal complex stretched. I think it's more like eight to 12. The literature actually ranges from 30 seconds to all night on how long to stretch per day. I've used an hour for a long time and I find that works well when I use a brace. So you're talking an hour per day for 12 weeks. People are not going to do the runner stretch that long every day and be consistent so with it. one out of 24 gives you the results to last continuously? Right. For most people who have a normal activity level, when I use a brace to stretch them, once they get stretched out, that usually is all it takes. Now, if there are extenuating circumstances like they're diabetic or they're an athlete or especially runners, they're going to tighten back up. So they need to be placed on a maintenance program to, to keep their stretch. I know you have a brace that does this stuff, and it's fascinating because it really thinks about it. I think you had it at the American Idol brace. I don't know that shows off the air, right. but I remember, I think that's what you called it a while ago. Watch TV and use this. And has that showing the results? I mean, it's been in the market now a little while. Are we getting? Yeah, yeah. there was a study done by another party that compared the importance of keeping the knee fully extended versus braces that don't. And ours showed a statistically better uh, outcome versus braces that do not keep the knee locked into extension while you're dorsiflexing the ankle. And that's really the key is our brace goes above the knee. It holds the knee into full extension while you're dorsiflexing the foot in the correct position because we use a wedge that goes under the hallux to supinate the foot, which it by, is done by engaging the windlass mechanism. Well, it seems like in just an hour, we're not going to worry about a DVT. We're not going to worry about some of the other things. Right. For the, so I think this is a great idea. I want to thank you. Please go to the forum. Go to forum.podiatricsuccess.com and share your opinion with Patrick. Thank you so much for thank being you, with Brett. us. Thanks. A pleasure.